Good afternoon or good morning to everyone else maybe joining from Chicago, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, good afternoon here in the Netherlands at least uh, and welcome at this series of six dialogues organized by Vereniging Delta Metropole in cooperation with the province of uh, Flevoland and the Floriade Expo in 2022. Um, my name is Sophie Stravens and I will be the host for the next 90 minutes during this conversation, this fourth dialogue of Going Green, how to work on these green cities. We are live from the Food Forum uh, Pavilion in the Floriade Park in Almere in the Netherlands and the aim of this six series is to think or research about the concept of these green cities and how to work towards that. Um, in line with the theme of the Floriade Expo, Growing Green Cities. Um, during every session, we will discuss another topic, another subject, uh, varying from climate resilience to circularity, self-sufficiency, uh, self the food system. But today, we will talk about logistics, the logistic landscape. And no other land, um, expands as re uh, land use expands as rapidly as in the Netherlands, as logistic does. And during the pandemic, we experienced this all, I guess, with a lot of online shopping. Um, and we had some debates about the verdosing, so-called in Dutch, the boxing of the big boxes in our green landscape um, and the um, spatial impact of um, logistic or distribution centers. Uh, yet, our ambitions to become a circular economy and eat more regional food, for example, uh, as we discussed during the previous talk, uh, depend on clever logistics systems. In this fourth talk, we will discuss it and how we can learn from logistics to build greener cities. Um, discuss some key innovations, some new concepts, and I won't do that all by myself. Luckily, we have some three amazing guests. Uh, two here at the table and one online. Um, I would like to welcome Claire Lister, um, Associate Professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Very welcome to you, Claire. Good morning to you. I think, hello, hello. Um, you just woke up or maybe you are up for a few <laughs> minutes and um, <laughs> you had your coffee and we are very, very, very happy that you are here with us online. Um, you will do a presentation for about 20, 25 minutes um, about your book, Learning from Logistics, and I will um, discuss that more um, later in a minute. And here at the table with me are um, Tim Beckman, CEO at Intuspace, okay. and um, Merten Neffs, a researcher at Vereniging Delta Metropole. And I have to mention that uh, Merten will replace Jana in this, uh, Jana Bistrik in this conversation. Um, she was uh, originally invited, but she couldn't be here, unfortunately. But we're happy that uh, Merten is here at the table. Um, and you will reflect on Claire's presentation, have a short pitch yourselves, and then we'll go into discussion with the three of you. Um, long introduction, let's just start with the presentation of Claire. I will give a short introduction, Claire, and then I will give um, um, the floor to you. Um, Claire Lister, an Irish-American architect uh, and associate professor, like I said, in Chicago, who likes to combine the reasonable with the radical. Uh, in her book, Learning from Logistics, from 2016, she explored the intriguing network and places of, co of companies such as FedEx and Ryanair to draw lessons for urban planners and architects. Lister collaborates with the Irish Pavilion at the 2021 Venice Biennale, showing the country uh, changes its territory to remain a global data hub. Well, live from Chicago, as I said, you are going to present, Claire, uh, some of your spatial logistic explorations, ending with some pressing questions uh, regarding the emerging logistic landscape after COVID-19, right? Um, I will give um, the floor to you. Okay, thank you, Merton. Thank you, Sophie. Um, thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you, Tim. Looking forward to chatting. Um, I'm going to start. I'm a little bit worried about this remote clicker, but let's see how it goes. Um, we have some, sorry, Claire, we have some difficulties okay. hearing you here in the studio. Okay, will, I'll just I'll hang on check. here then. I will have a check. Just go on and I will check if the audience will hear you. Um, Okay, yeah. is the presentation ready to go? 
There we go. I'm going to hit my 25 minutes. Okay. Um, We're hearing you again. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. I'm just going to... Yeah, the, the, the live clicker is not working. Oh, there we go. Okay. I might have to refresh it every now and then, so just bear with me. Um, okay. Let's go get on here. Um, it's... A conflict to say that logistics can be green or either offer models on how the city might become greener. After all, logistics is a high resource space of capitalism. Logistical systems have become vital to supply chains because since the 1970s, production and labor has become a fragmented and international network. It's still cheaper to make goods in one part of the world, assemble them in another and ship them to another. Speed is a technology and instrumental and automated fulfillment centers. A map of the raw materials for an iPhone lists 30 countries in the supply chain. And Jan Volder's map of the material chain of an Amazon Alexa similarly exposes the resourcing required of this seemingly benign home assistant. Having Amazon deliver a package to a doorstep in Almira more or less for free or for very low cost with a product made in the Far East is not really environmentally sustainable. Logistics is an oversimplification and an idealized concept. Moreover, logistical facilities, and I cite data centers, warehouses, shipping terminals, use vast amounts of land and construction. Amazon's largest warehouse in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, is 3.6 million square feet. That's 13 football fields. Then there's the water and energy for operations of these facilities. In Ireland, where I come from, and this is the subject of our project in Venice, the big four American IT companies, that's Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, have data storage facilities. These data farms are the backstage spaces that support logistics, where the information required to run the supply chains is hosted. These supposedly will use up 30% of the nation's electricity by 2030. Social sustainability, I think, is also something that we might talk about today. Labor practices in warehouses and fulfillment centers is problematic in some companies, as is safety with supposedly 12 hour work shifts for Amazon employees where they must scan as many as 700 products per hour and are regularly fired for missing rates. Automation is also proving a problem when it comes to employment in the gig economy. In addition, local brick and mortar stores, once the mainstay of the urban high street are closing as they cannot compete um, and we're left with empty cities in our downtown areas. Cities such as New York here promise money to lure the tech giants such as Amazon to New York City a couple of years ago when the city proposed almost $3 billion in government incentives to host Amazon's second headquarters. In summary, the platforms of the 21st century are not really sustainable environmentally or socially. However, as Sophie said, the lockdown during COVID accelerated our alliance on logistical systems. Online media subscriptions and e-commerce with home delivery soared as people were reluctant or prohibited to shop in person. This acceleration of logistical dependency presents a new approach to logistics as an everyday space in the city one that behooves us to rethink how we might integrate logistical systems into our present urban frameworks. As Sophie said in 2016, um, I wrote a book that looked at many of these logistical platforms and tried to mine them for some greater urban intelligence. The book is divided into five chapters that each explore how logistical platforms, and again, Amazon, Facebook, Ryanair, FedEx, Uber, etc., are transforming the built environment. And more significantly, to deploy logistical intelligence to re-script the city, given that systems of flow, that is the flow of stuff, people, and information, are now the dominant shapers of the city and culture. The book combines theory and analysis of the platform case studies 
and ends with design projections that try to better integrate logistics into the city or leverage logistics toward other outcomes. And for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus um, and expand on these um, that might sort of prompt some um, discussion as we move forward. So some of the key concepts um, that emerged in the book. And so what I'm, I'm just going to mention these key concepts and then maybe just talk about a few drawings that try to apply or test these concepts in practice. So the first thing that emerges um, in the research is um, that logistics measures space temporally as opposed to metrically. We used to measure the city in terms of the distance from A to B. Now we measure the city in terms of how long it takes for something to get from A to B. And that's kind of pretty transformational. The image on the left is a diagram that shows cargo flights coming in and out of Memphis International Airport, which is, X, which is like DHL in the US. Um, and you'll notice that peaks and valleys, incredible moments of intensification when the packages come in are sorted in very, very quick time frames and then um, sent back out on outgoing um, planes. And so that allows you and me to put a package in a drop box at 11 o'clock at night in New York and have um, a package delivered by 7 a.m. in Los Angeles the next time, the next day. Sorry, my thing keeps. Um, and that's kind of amplified if you start to look at latest trends um, by some logistical companies where um, there's a kind of move to deliver packages in ever faster timeframes. Um, in the US, you have Amazon promising one hour delivery if you order by a certain time in the morning and you live in an urban area. And that's prompting um, Amazon now to start to think about developing what they're calling micro warehouses. That's not the big super football field size facilities, but smaller scale um, facilities in dense urban areas to meet the demands of this one hour delivery. And, and this first project that I'm showing um, very quickly just kind of responds to that. And, and this is not necessarily very critical of logistics. It's more accepting the proliferation of logistics and wondering what we might do with it. Um, this is for a warehouse in an urban area that combines um, a public park um, on the roofscape. This is nothing radical. Um, but interestingly enough, the park the surface of the park is organized in the same way that the interior of the warehouse is organized um, where popular products are closest to access points. It's kind of was an interesting idea for zoning. Um, and then puts wraps housing on the edge of it as a way to describe the warehouse um, and then starts to think about the kind of quality of that as a public or community space in the neighborhood. So there's a bit of give and back take between the warehouse and its um, impending context. The second concept that I think might be useful to talk about um, in the conversation, and I'm wondering, you know, if what Tim um, might think of some of these um, is the notion of bundle um, as a way to optimize. Um, again, this is a diagram of the FedEx super hub at Memphis International Airport, which again is where the main sort center for FedEx exists. And what's very clever about FedEx is that they completely optimize the use of the airport. Again, because most of their sorting takes place at nighttime, they can use the airport 24 seven. So the top diagram is a diagram of the kind of use of Memphis Airport. And the bottom diagram is a more typical diagram. It happens to be Chicago you see airport obviously is kind of pretty vacant between mid and 6 a.m in the morning and so the kind of logic that logistics are very smart in terms of using current infrastructure at off peak times I think is something that we might learn learn forward um, and so that got me thinking about using um, um, uh, infrastructure that's kind of um, not optimized at the moment or vacant infrastructure or revitalizing old industrial infrastructure um, to meet the demands of delivery in cities. And oddly enough, this is a map of an underground network in Chicago that was built in 1906. It was built 
um, to deliver freight to all the department stores in Chicago. So a very smart, innovative idea over 110 years ago. And the idea for this kind of quick speculation was to redeploy this network. And there you see it in the green. That's all tunnels about 40 feet below grade. And that you would start to use these tunnels as um, conduits for the delivery of packages. And that then you would have um, little pickup or drop off stations with elevators up to the surface of the city where people could interact um, with this delivery system. And then of course, piggybacking on that, you start to see other public spaces that might align itself with this project. So it becomes a kind of catalyst for other things in the city. Um, and again, um, the notion that logistics might not just operate on its own intelligence, but might start to catalyze other important urban functions within its own logic. Um, and so like there's a program diagram um, for that. So it might be regional food drop off. Um, it might be bike station. It might be it was dropping off luggage for passengers to go to O'Hare um, and then combined with more typical public programs. So you're really activating logistics now. It's not something that's out there and external to how we live, which is kind of how it operates at the moment. Another quick speculation on that, this is a diagram of Michigan Avenue. I don't know in the Netherlands, but um, unfortunately we're suffering from a lot of vacant real estate in our big cities in the US at the moment, especially post COVID. And this was an idea to reuse again, the large department stores in Chicago, of which we have many from the 19th century and use them as um, fulfillment or warehouse um, spaces that again might start to reactivate um, these very large buildings um, in the city with both um, sort of industrial program. Um, so a hybrid between warehouse, um, recreational space um, and public space. I'm going through these very quickly. I'm just skipping over that image because it takes a bit too long to talk about it. Um, in as a, a teacher, um, I run sort of some studios where students start to think about these things with me. Um, and this was a project that looked at how perhaps Uber or other um, online transportation systems might start to augment existing public transportation systems. So the map on the left is a map of Chicago showing areas where public transportation is poor or showing voids in the city. Um, and since it's very expensive, like, you know, it's, it's like a lot of money for a city to build a train line or to kind of extend its public infrastructure system. The notion that you might redeploy Uber under a different political model, of course, to kind of pick up the kind of slack or to kind of augment a public transportation system where there are voids. And so again, the kind of logic of Uber, and I'm just using Uber as a name, um, it could be any um, online pickup transportation company would start to kind of operate as a semi kind of public utility system, picking up and bringing people to train stations or bus stations in areas where it's not safe to walk. And we have many of those areas in Chicago, unfortunately, um, or in areas where there's too far a distance between adjacent um, train stations. So again, um, allowing some logistical platform to provide more equity and access in areas that it doesn't already exist. Um, just again, I'm moving in and out here of historical and contemporary precedents. Um, interestingly enough, um, we think that all of these logistical platforms just happened in the last 10 years. And if you look back in history, there's actually very interesting models, especially under this term of bling, logistics and existing tra transportation. This is um, the mail order, Chicago is the mail order capital of the world, or at least was in the 19th century. This is an image of the warehouse of Sears Roebuck in Chicago, um, which was basically an Amazon of its day. Instead of a website, it had a catalog of like a 300 page catalog that was sent out to rural areas. So you have to think the rural urban dynamic was very different in this era. And um, customers would pick products from the catalog and order them through their post office um, or through mail and it would be delivered to them from this warehouse via a train system. 
Um, now, again, this is pre-automobile, but even when the automobile came into use, um, the train system, the existing train system was the primary system by which the goods were delivered. And so the, the warehouse was built over train tracks. Today, our warehouses are built close to kind of highway infrastructure. Um, and the storage was all at the very top floor of the building and products would go down to the train flat platform via chutes. So it's kind of a gravity delivery system and right into train bins and shipped out to customers. Kind of really interesting, all sorts of interesting ways how they kind of um, ordered, you know, processed orders in a kind of pre-technological era. Um, another interesting um, historical distribution system that I thought was worth mentioning is the pneumatic uh, mail system that was very popular in many cities in the early 20th century in Paris and London and in Prague especially, um, and where you had mail messages put into these canisters that were then inserted into these kind of pneumatic tubes and, and a kind of air pressure was um, would whoosh or send the container um, through the city incredibly fast, incredibly efficient. And I like how there was lots of speculations at the time in terms of how that pneumatic food system could be um, deployed to deliver other logistical systems, as in this case, food. Now, this is a funny kind of kind of um, um, comic take on, 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 on how it would work, but the logic that you could, um, there would be centralized kitchens in Berlin that would send food out and liberating the housewife of the 1930s from her chores in the kitchen and delivering her food via the pneumatic system. But again, it's funny, but you know, again, even in that era, trying to be really smart about how delivery might occur. The other interesting thing that you notice about logistics is on the one hand, you have the super big, heavy footprints of the warehouses. And on the other side, you have what I'm calling these micro nodes or devices, gadgets that interface between you and me, the users, with these kind of very complex logistical systems. And I became interested in these nodes and kind of looking for evidence of them in the city. Um, in fact, Amazon have a whole patent for kind of micro nodes that might um, um, sort of, this is like for a, an exchange or a return station, a booth um, in the city. And that got me, and here's some other, this is Tesco's um, shopping facade in Korea, um, sort of um, um, automated grocery stores in Shanghai the FedEx office, and you can see the density of these nodes in downtown Manhattan. Um, and then, of course, new forms of delivery that are very light on the ground. And this got me thinking about, um, you know, the kind of, again, the access that's available through these micro light nodes is actually quite amazing. And so I began to kind of, how would you deploy that um, in a library network in Chicago? Um, and again, the diagram on the left shows, um, of course, every library has stacks and a reading room coupled together. But if you started to decouple that um, and had all the, the books in one facility and then just had reading nodes and you could have much more of them and you would then move the books between these different nodes, which would mean that you don't have to have the same copy of every book at every station. And so Claire, the model sorry, then Claire, goes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Hello? I will. I would like to give you a small. I would like to give you a small. Like that that you is a about small five minutes uh, for the presentation. Later. Okay. Thank you very Sounds much. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so the idea that this would be a large. This is the facility for the 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 book warehouse, um, and then the books, the nodes would be um, maybe attached to train stations, grocery stores, landmarks and delivered by other forms of transportation from water taxi um, to motorcycle, um, getting a far more dynamic and quicker um, distribution system. Um, technology, of course, is also very interesting. Um, the uh, What's amazing about logistic systems is their combination of both hybrid um, or um, hard physical infrastructure and soft technological infrastructure. Um, and the, the kind of 
role of apps and online and, and websites, again, as an interface between you, the user, and these systems is kind of offers also some lessons. And this was an idea for like a shared garden system, um, doesn't have a context, kind of an unknown context, um, but that you could go on an app and you could rent a garden because you live in a high rise or you're in an area where you can't have one. And you could rent a garden um, through this app that would coordinate which is exactly what logistics does, um, a kind of user interface. Um, and you could rent a garden with different facilities depending on what you want to do. So again, the kind of combination of soft infrastructure and hard infrastructure that logistics is so good at offers us interesting models for shared infrastructure in the city. Um, and then to kind of finish up, of course, we're looking at alternative models where logistical systems are used, uh, for example, in the um, um, supply of medical um, supplies in rural areas. We're looking at the integration now of logistics into cultural spaces. Um, this is a library, a Helmut Jahn library at the University of Chicago, where all the stacks are below ground. The reading room is a free space and the books are ordered through your phone. The students order the books through their phone and um, a sort of industrial robot um, picks the book, puts it in this little bin in the foreground of this picture, and um, the student picks it up. That got me thinking about um, integrating more cultural program into logistics. This is a data center um, in Chicago, um, and the water that's used to cool the servers, of course, data centers demand a lot of cooling, um, is um, passes through the facility and then the warm air forms a hot tub, a municipal hot tub for the community. And then as the water cools, it goes back in and feeds the system. And so that's kind of an idea of industrial symbiosis where the resort or the waste of one industry becomes a, a resource for another and offers some interesting ideas for crossover between logistical processes and public program. The last thing I want to end on is perhaps maybe outside of design a little bit because it's more about policy. This image is the Seagram building in New York um, from the 1950s by Mies van der Rohe. And you'll notice that there's a, a public space in front of the building. And that was um, the zoning code at that time in New York allowed developers to build taller buildings if they gave back a public space to the city. And I became interested in this kind of give back um, that perhaps there might be new policies that might mandate some logistical companies um, to give back to communities in, in ways. And there are actually precedents for that. If you look at um, some uh, late 19th, early 20th century um, companies, for example, Cadbury's, I don't know if you've Cadbury's chocolate in the Netherlands, it's a famous chocolate company. Um, and Richard Cadbury, who was a Quaker, an interesting background, um, developed the company town, which was called Bourneville, um, in outside Birmingham in the UK. Now, the sort of very well known for its uh, arts and crafts style buildings, but the idea that you um, would provide for the kind of community slightly paternalistic and i'm not saying that this is an ideal model by any means but the notion that there was a recognition between the kind of primary employers of the area and the way the kind of livelihood um, and the health of the employees um, was kind of um, is an interesting model um, and, and and just to end on um, uh, again in the studio I did a couple of years ago, um, a student taking those ideas, um, developing a kind of super mega warehouse um, combined with housing and other public functions that are sort of collapsed together into a kind of new type of logistical urban system where warehousing, shipping, um, and living and public facilities are integrated into one sort of hybrid urban model. That'd be something we start to think about. Um, and then, of course, I, I, do, I like this image and I don't like this image because it's kind of aestheticizes many of the problems of logistics, but it's just there to kind of show how perhaps, again, public program rubs up 
with the kind of logistical processes in a kind of more conceptual way um, and might offer us some lessons. And I think I'm going to leave it at that, just under 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to talking with Sophie Merton and Tim about more ideas for greener logistics, or at least integrated logistics moving forward. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Claire. It was a very, very inspirational talk, a presentation, if I may say, also for Merton and Tim, but um, sure. many times there were some, uh, um, well, I saw some facial expressions <laughs> like really, that's that's something really inspirational. And to me, oh, I can't works. see their expressions. All I can see is myself. So oh, let's yeah. let's check. Well, we I, I think the, the technical people know now. So let's see if that's okay. uh, that's possible. We'll try that's to do better. that. Thank you. But I can tell you, um, yeah, they're, they're inspiring, inspiring, really. Um, and to me, it also struck that there were new ideas, but also these more older ideas, even from more than a century ago, that is still so inspiring. So definitely uh, something to discuss, I would say. Um, and I think first I will go to Merton uh, before I go to Tim um, for a short um, well, reflection on the presentation, but also both of you prepared uh, some kind of pitch. Well, let me introduce Merton uh, first. A researcher um, currently work, working on your PhD, Landscapes of Trade, at uh, Delft University of Technology and Erasmus School of Economics. Um, the research focuses on the driving forces at the logistics in the Netherlands and the possibilities to make it more sustainable. Um, and as a project leader at Vereniging Delta Metropole, you also organize all kinds of activities to stimulate the debate about this topic and the spatial qualities. And within this role, you also organized um, a design challenge, which is called Out of the Box. And you together with you. Uh, together with me. Yeah, that's true. That's, <laughs> by but coincidence. For now, you, uh, you, you can talk about it by coincidence. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. What, what do you think, Merit? What do I think? Yeah. Well, I already read uh, Claire's book a few years yeah. ago when I started my research on the PhD. And that what I really like about it is that it's, um, uh, it adds something to the debate in the Netherlands, which we are lacking. Um, yeah because uh, our, our town planners and spatial planners, they either forget about logistics altogether mm -hmm. or uh, there's some kind of uh, a negative uh, tone to it because of the, the impacts that distribution yeah. centers can also have, uh, which is true. But um, what, what Claire does, and I think that's uh, courageous and uh, very ne necessary to do, uh, is to actually learn from all these lessons uh, and inno innovative techniques yeah. in and to logistics. to see the potential. And to see the potential and try to apply it to how we um, try to make better cities and more sustainable cities. Yeah. Um, and she named quite a few already in, in this talk, so yeah. I think we have enough to talk about. I think so too. Um, but sh should I show something about the design challenge? Yeah, it's that a bit could improvised, be really, yeah. of course, because I'm replacing It's very Yana. last minute, yeah. We'll uh, take that all into account. Well, I think first this is Tim's oh. uh, story, so I'll <laughs> click quick, quickly through this. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this design challenge uh, that we organized, uh, we in this case is the Vereniging Delta Metropole and uh, the Architecture Center of Tilburg yeah. a year ago, uh, uh, was about make, how to make uh, the logistic landscape of the future. And we challenged four design teams to come up with ideas of how that might look like. Uh, and they were supported by all kinds of experts also. For example, here, this is Bart Kuipers from the Erasmus University talking about how logistic systems work. And um, four teams made four proposals. Uh, this one is uh, actually by uh, Jana Bistrik, who should have been here uh, yeah. today, but um, this one is called Intangible Superstructures. Uh, and that is about how this large scale of logistics could be incorporated in your daily living environment and also uh, be able to, to incorporate, for example, smaller businesses so that everybody can actually tap into the, the use of these big boxes. Mm -hmm. And so it has a, an added value to the neighborhood. Yeah. You can even do your sports on the roof, for example. Um, really nice idea, which is totally related to what Claire was also showing us. And I think also what Tim is going to show us later. Uh, this idea, Package to the People, was from another team. And that's about uh, how 
Uh, it's a very funny picture, by the way. <laughs> uh, how, how to integrate logistics in on the micro level of your neighborhood. So really get it into your, for example, uh, your cupboards uh, or your basement that you're not using. Empty or garages. Empty garage boxes, uh, so, uh, you know, places um, in the neighborhood that are not very used, but could be some kind of a hub in a logistic network that could serve not only the, the big global companies, but also maybe um, smaller companies in the neighborhood itself, uh, suppliers of, of nice food or... Yeah. Uh, to make it a really a local system. A local system yeah. integrated with the, the bigger system. Um, this one, Brabant Stream, focuses more on uh, the use of the water system, which is also very important because you can uh, transport goods more sustainably over the water and you could also imagine that distribution centers could be more connected to this water system and even have, be floating or going from A to B while they distribute something. Uh, so that was also interesting I thought. Uh, and mm -hmm. this one is uh, it became kind of famous after <laughs> the design challenge in the Netherlands. It's called the Golden Box. Uh, which is basically the simple idea uh, of how, uh, what happens if you just stack all the logistics you need for a, a region up into one big box, um, put some other functions uh, together to make it work, and then the rest of the, uh, the, the territory is free of logistics. So it's, it's an extreme. Um, and I would like to end this pitch with uh, uh, a foreign example uh, that, I, that I really like a lot. Um, I think we can also learn a lot from that, not only from Chicago, but also Paris in this case. Uh, this is uh, a, a train hub with electrical uh, sustainable transport uh, with on top of it a distribution center in the sort of yeah, the edge of the city of Paris. Um, and on top of that, even there is stacked housing and uh, offices, urban gardening, uh, agriculture and sports. Uh, and all of this uh, from a real estate perspective was very viable uh, and prof profitable uh, and I think that what we can learn from this is that as a government uh, you can also make the difference and you can start making uh, doing things differently. The, the mayor of Paris in this case decided to get rid of diesel trucks and uh, so the whole sector needed to innovate and the government also invested in making these things possible. The, 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 the railway company in this case. So I, I think I'll leave nice. it at that. Perfect, uh, thank you. Uh, very nice examples as well, I think. And it maybe it's it's worth worth mentioning that uh, especially the design challenge was more <clears> like um, um, yeah some kind of exercise within a very small amount of time, short amount of time, um, to see like where are the possibilities and how can we think differently instead of like you already said the discussion is about uh, all these big boxes monofunctional in the landscape, but how can we think differently and what are the chances? as well. Tim Beckman, you mm -hmm. are here uh, at the yes. table as well and you are actually developing these big boxes. Yes. Um, let me introduce you, CEO yes. at <coughs> Interspace, the log uh, logistic real estate branch of uh, Somerset Capital Partners. Yes. And you are really committing, <coughs> together with your colleagues, of course, I, I assume, uh, in developing sustainable distribution centers, right, for future generations, so, so you told That's me, correct. with an efficient and multifunctional use yeah. of space. Um, you have worked within several uh, logistic companies, so you have a very broad knowledge yeah. about this, uh, of the change and the operational system. And you will take us with you in a project uh, you are developing or working on right now, right? Yeah, yeah that's correct. So first of all, I would like to give a compliment to Claire for a very inspiring vision. And, and, and it's a very, I like the approach and I like the idea very much of how to approach the topic of how to integrate logistics on a different way. Yeah, because um, as you mentioned, as Sophie mentioned, I've, I've worked until now, uh, uh, up to and until, let's say up to 20 years of my career, I've worked in logistics. Uh, I've been educated logistics um, and that means that I do understand that logistics itself has a very essential social function. 
Um, and I, I think that only became clear, as you mentioned already, uh, during the, the corona pandemic. I think we've shown that what the importance of logistics was and that they can take care of supplying the goods and taking care that the whole society kept on going. The only thing that, that I regret a bit is that we've indeed forgotten uh, um, about how to integrate logistics in our landscape again. Mm. And, and that means, and I was really surprised to see that already 100 years ago, they had much, much better and more innovative ideas than we have nowadays. So this was a real eye-opener and very inspiring, to be, to be honest. Um, but it's a bit of a shame because, as if because of the lack of any vision on how to deal with logistics, you give logistics also a bit of a, you leave it open to the market and you leave it open to um, um, all kind of market companies, and that means that it now happens and it now exists on a way that we more suffer from it than we benefit from it. Of course, we benefit from the the single uh, function of logistics itself, uh, but we do not enjoy the fact anymore that it's now uh, disturbing our landscape. Uh, we, we have to deal with polluting cars, we have to deal with all the kind of congestion. And I think that needs to be different. Yeah, because um, I really do think that you can deal with this on a complete different way. And that's the reason why we decided as into space, because we've recently became the largest logistics real estate development company in the Netherlands. And I think that gives you a very big advantage. Because of, if, if I say now, when we are going to do this completely mm -hmm. different, I think that all my competitors and all my other colleagues they in the market, they look pleased <laughs> on how, what's happening over there, and, and probably it makes sense, and should we consider something? So that means that at least you're able, I think, to create some, hopefully, yeah. create some movement and inspire others in this. And how do you use that advantage? <laughs> well, we use that advantage, as, as we have said, that logistics, uh, real estate, um, should be, um, uh, we should deal with this completely different I and mean, mm -hmm. it should not be real estate anymore that we suffer from, but we should, be, we should create real estate that we enjoy. And that means that we, can think, we think that we can contribute to the environment and building a better environment by using our logistics real estate on multiple ways mm -hmm. and integrating this better in society. So I've brought with me some, some pictures of how we deal with this, for instance, in a project that we are going to build in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And what uh, functions do you add? What new functions? Well, this is a lot of functions because I think in the, the discussions that we see now in the Netherlands is that we would like to separate logistics on a single campus mm -hmm. and then maintaining the single function of storage and, uh, and, and, and as transport hubs. But then you do not add really value. So what we said is, well, probably we have to think about what happens over there and can we also create more, let's say, economic value to the buildings that we built. Uh, and, and what we have as a project, I, there were only three slides, but I can show you a bit. The project that we are working on at the moment, oh, I go back, is uh, we will start construction um, as of next year mm -hmm. and this is a, a campus where we said well let's pick up the idea of how to deal with city logistics last mile logistics this is something real hot topic at this moment of every city in the netherlands how can we keep livable cities yeah. uh, in the netherlands and that's the reason why we said well probably we can contribute to that on a lot of ways on one way we can build a very large a city hub at the center of the of the, the city of Amsterdam, where we can decouple uh, transport, uh, so we can ensure uh, we can support and facilitate that the trucks do not have to enter the city centers mm -hmm. anymore, but they can here reload um, all their products into, for instance, electrical vans, yeah. so that we can with clean transport enter into the city of Amsterdam. And we got the support for this from an electricity company that says, let us pick up the challenge and let we create over here an infrastructure for 800 vehicles to load and charge their batteries the moment that they are here loading and unloading uh, on your premises. So that's, one, that's a single function of logistics only. Yeah. We think that we can contribute already with this single function to a more livable city because we keep the trucks out of yeah. the city and we support, which is a huge challenge, we should support in this the electrification of the transport uh, yeah. network. 
and that's a system change, I assume, which, uh, um, um, well, you need some other kind of uh, infrastructure, electoral yeah, or yes. energy infrastructure. Yes, for sure, but we do more. So yeah. it, it, Otherwise, we're going to talk about the technical part. Tell us, part, Tell real us part, what you but do, we more. do more. I'm curious. <laughs> so we say also we have to be careful. Oh, sorry that I click on the slides. We have to be careful and, and, and to use the ground available mm -hmm. on a very uh, sustainable way. So let us build the warehouse in multiple multi levels. Yeah. Uh, that's something we hardly see in the Netherlands at this moment. So we are going to test case now with both what we call multi-level warehouses as well as multi-story warehouses. Mm -hmm. The multi-level warehouse is two warehouses built on top of each other yeah. where the products are moved vertically with a cargo elevator. Mm -hmm. Multi-story warehouse is an elevator where, of is a warehouse where we have also double stacked a warehouse, but there we allow the trucks to move up to the, mm -hmm. to the first floor and load, unload over there. So we have two stories of warehouse. And then on top of that, we build a parking roof, but we also build um, some kind of park gardens over there. Uh, for, and recreation. We, for recreation. For yeah. recreation. Uh, we, we took care that also the office space are partly built on the roof. So that mm -hmm. means that they are looking over the gardens over there. So that it mean, becomes also a nicer place for everybody working there. Go outside and sit also over there in a green environment. But we do more. <laughs> so this is, this is how we build. So we can say, okay, let's let's... Be careful with the environment we have available, so let's double use it. So we have two layers of warehouse, on top of this is a roof uh, where we can park the cars, and on top of that we have the PV panels in a sort of carports available. Mm -hmm. But we also want to build a nice environment where it's nice to work and it's nice to stay. And it also, and so we build over here a campus environment, so also the office buildings on the front of, the, of, of this uh, project uh, are part of the Total Click project, the City Logistics Innovation Campus, um, where we think that we also want to connect the companies working here, mm -hmm. so the logistics companies, we want to connect them with each other and uh, create a kind of innovation community. Yeah. So uh, we have the support of the University of Amsterdam and we have the support of a very large uh, Dutch Knowledge Institute mm -hmm. uh, and say and they work here together with us together with the companies active in last mile logistics in innovation on last mile logistics. Yeah. So it's some kind of knowledge hub when combining all these, these exactly. different parties and companies exactly. together. So also there's room for startups in yeah. new battery technologies, there's room for startups in optimizing software, how to bundle transport better um, and it means that we actually try to build also a very nice environment and show us, and I hope that this is clear on the picture, that logistics buildings don't have to be ugly. The logistics buildings don't have to be a place where it's not nice to stay or not nice to work. Mm -hmm. We think here, because uh, on the front end, there is even a hotel function with some short stay uh, possibilities. So we try to integrate living, working, uh, recreation, there's some restaurants over there, as well as yeah. innovation. So that for all kind of employees, there is a very interesting job available over there. But I think then if you build such a complex project over here, then you can also prove to the environment what the relevance of this project is and what the relevance of this uh, location is. So that nobody doubts anymore for me. I see their gray, uh, uh, ugly gray boxes, but that people like to embrace this project from, hey, this is logistics on a different mm -hmm. way yeah. uh, that you can deal with this as well. Yeah. You can, also, can almost see the subterranean uh, cargo network here and uh, exactly. tubes for, for yes. shooting lunch uh, to some, yeah. some hotel. No, but but all, I, I heard a lot of things from Claire, but it's also interesting because the, one of the professors working with us on this project mentioned that there is nothing more uh, unsustainable at this moment as cooking from your home yourself mm -hmm. because you produce a lot of waste and you produce a lot of uh, nitro oxygen which you yeah. can avoid at the moment that it's cooked on a central location. Yeah. So one of the, the, the participants in this project is a, one of the largest European caterers mm -hmm. which are going to cook meals and prepare meals over here and distribute them then later yeah. into uh, the Amsterdam city. Yeah. 
an example of how logistics, exactly. logistics can help so. on a yeah. different level to, to yeah. become more green. Claire, um, if you see this, if you hear this, do you think this is um, uh, the right way to go? Can you give a quick response to that before we go into some statements and polls? <laughs> No, I think, I mean, I think it's fantastic. It's so easy just to talk about these ideas, which is what <laughs> I do. Tim has the hard job to implement that. And I think it's probably very difficult because you have multiple stakeholders in, you know, that all have a voice, whether it's the university or you as a real estate company and renting and leasing the facilities and then what the actual companies need for their facilities, which is probably different depending on what everyone is storing or what their um, what the nature of their logistical model is. Um, so I, I, I think it could be a really, really interesting prototype. Um, I'm wondering, um, Tim, is it still more favorable to develop edge city facilities um, like bring logistics, bring the products to the people? Um, or is there also an idea for building warehousing facilities and logistical facilities in urban areas? Now, I know that poses a problem because there's very little land and you have to think about putting it somewhere else. But um, is it still favorable to build outside cities? I, I think if I may respond to that, we have a, actually a statement and a poll about this. So maybe we can, I, I'll <laughs> oh, save this do. question. I, I've written it down and we'll come back to that later. But thank you very much. It was already great introduction. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to say to the online audience, you can send in questions as well via the chat. Uh, so please do. And we just launched the first poll, the statements, and I will read it to you as well. Should city planners and designers learn from logistics to build green cities? Uh, is that yes? Yes, definitely. Concepts from the logistics center, uh, sector can help cities become green or no. Um, the logistics sector first become uh, needs to become sustainable itself. Um, so online you can vote as well, and I can see the answers coming mm -hmm. in right now. Um, well, Claire, I think it will be an obvious answer for you, but can you um, um, give the answer? <laughs> can logistics <laughs> help in building green cities? <laughs> Just yes well, or I mean, no? I is, think... is... Oh, I can only say yes. <laughs> For, for now, just, uh, just a yes or a no? <laughs> um, yes, I think we can, but it's a, yeah. very, it's, it's a very difficult, it's a contradiction too. And I think everyone recognizes yeah. that. Um, exactly. I see um, uh, Tim and Merton yeah, nodding yeah, here sure, as well. I sure. think your, uh, your presentation showed us already. We need um, to. We it. need to do it, yeah, definitely. And also, can it work the other way around, like um, uh, building on green cities and I I think make the logistics more sustainable um, as well. Yeah, so. I, I think 100% and I, and, and I agree also that needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, I think there is no alternative of not doing it. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, it is very important that we do start creating new visions, yeah. creating new ideas because we are living in an open uh, open economy and it means that we leave this now up to market companies in order to deal with logistics yeah. solutions and build our own society, have built our own uh, facilities. And I think we should support them and help them in yeah. showing how we can do this differently. Yeah, there was uh, Merton. Oh, there was actually uh, Jana. I did some preliminary meeting with her as well. And she had this interesting statement, actually. Uh, she was raising the question, like, can we even talk about logistics on a whole um, because logistics are many 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 things it's the buildings it's uh, the distribution centers it's the uh, the building sites it's about people about legacy it's all these different parts um, maybe Claire if you can elaborate on that or re react on that a bit if you listen to that are there any parts or different elements we should or we could focus on maybe yeah I would add I would add to that list I mean logistics again um we're talking about logistics just from the perspective of goods um mm -hmm. but cities have always struggled with logistical systems whether it was sewage in the 19th century whether it's garbage and trash and food 
um, you know, the Roman city had all sorts of fascinating ways of keeping grain close to the city because if the population got hungry, um, Rome was in a very weak position. So the logic of supply and demand is as old as the idea as the city itself. And so um, I'm also interested in the other logistical systems in addition to the list that the, that, um, the viewer made. Um, you know, how can you start to think about innovative trash systems? Um, how do you start to think about, you know, recycling water in some of these facilities? Um, there's it, it the the list is kind of endless. Um, it doesn't just stop with the kind of front end. Like we forget that logistics also has a has the other side. Like we focus so much on the delivery, mm -hmm. and then as if the system stops there. But there's the packaging that's on the box. There's um, you know the kind of obsolete culture that we live in, where oh I'll just order something new. It's it's kind of an endless circle, and so um, I I think it's actually naive to just focus on the supply side. That there's a whole other back end to logistics that demands just as much thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. As going from the linear forward. to the circular economy is that's really a task for logistics also to pull off. Yeah. If we yeah. want to. Um, uh, logistics is really a gray area. It, it includes parts of the manufacturing ecosystems as well. So if you want to refurbish yeah. products instead of just trashing them and buying new mm -hmm. stuff, uh, we need smart logistics to, to make that. But, but actually, I think indeed logistics is one of the building blocks of our economy because mm -hmm. all our economy is about trading and producing goods and, and moving them around and, and handling and dealing with all the information and, and, and even yeah. finance flow. I think it's this. clear we, we need it. We exactly. are very much depending exactly. on it. So you should indeed see it as, as an integrated part. And then you can think about, it, okay, how can we make a city more efficient? Because that would be a better question, I think, instead of focusing on logistics infrastructure only. Make, yeah. How can we make an, a city more efficient, take care that it's easily supplied, that it's a very livable city, that everything functions and works again. And I think, and I assume, that this was also um, one of the main criteria when historically cities were, were developed. Yeah. Do you even think there should be more awareness of all these chances of logistics? For example, you said about the food uh, distribution, that logistics can even uh, if we improve logistic or use it even more to become more green? 100% for sure, but it's a very, very tough question because yeah. also the logistics sector itself, and then I have to be honest, yeah. is also working very hard to make themselves unpopular. Yeah. And you see what's happening, and it's, I'm not sure if this is to blame the companies like Amazon or whatever, I, I don't think so, because we as a consumer, mm -hmm. we decide what will happen and what will be the next infrastructure. Yeah. If we decide to buy, up, to buy our products online, then we see a movement that all our shops are getting empty yeah. and that we build online warehouses. Definitely, what we call definitely. Big boxes. But as a consumer, um, you always, not always, but it's, it's logical as well to choose for the cheapest option. Um, or and the most convenient, because I think online is more about convenience as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. But then you don't get the choice when you press the buy button, like uh, where, where does it, in which yeah. Yeah, but even center if is you get processed. the choice, I think even if we would probably say, well, let's make a very, um, uh, 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 how do you say, the sustainable mm -hmm. decision on how to, for which choice we took. But I think 90% of the society would choose for the most convenient one yeah. and the cheapest solution. Yeah, yeah. And is it then possible uh, to become more sustainable without uh, putting our cities in the hands of the very large uh, e-commerce platforms? 100%. I think we, but, but we therefore, at least in our, because we are not China, we are not a regulated mm -hmm. government, we're not a regulated economy, so I think we need to provide some guidelines, we need to provide some And ideas. who is we? Well, I think of course, we look at what the governments can do, but mm -hmm. I think it's up to the to the uh, market and up to the logistics sector themselves, yeah. the logistics development companies, the, the the real estate sector, 
to come up with an idea how good looks like so that we can advise our government from hey we you this need to coordinate a little bit and this could be an idea how to do it because it's a very very complex topic so that means you cannot expect from the government who studied politics that they can now make decision on how to build cities or how to deal with logistics yeah. but we are here i think in order to give them the advice and the ideas yeah. but i think right, if you ask uh, google to uh, make a green city they will they will do it i mean 100%. Um, I, um, yeah. the tendency is that they, they get bigger also amazon and these companies yeah, but, but most, Alibaba, the majority the majority of all companies are here they want to do good and, and and the only thing is we have to help them what is good and if if and okay we of course we see also that we dealing in a um, uh, society where we aim for replaceable products and we aim for the cheapest products um, uh, but but I think there is a huge opportunity because there's a lot of companies that just like to show the market how they can do yeah. things better yeah. Every, the social responsibility is there everywhere and do these big Let platforms have a place in, in that uh, well, together with the small ones well for for the real estate sector it hadn't so that means that we have now started to create a platform to show from guys we should um, uh, work together in order to come up with solutions because we all agree that we can't continue like this yeah. and we all and it's, it's therefore very inspiring to see in the presentation that even 100 years ago yeah. we had better ideas than we have today yeah. and, and Claire I would like to, to have your perspective on this as well I thought yeah I mean I, I think for me the question like you know can like it, it's, it's an oversimplification I mean it's really complex and so I struggle to say yes or no, um, <laughs> because it's not that easy. But I also, I mean, it's it's contingent on our economic model, which at the moment is not a sustainable economic model in that it's cheaper to make something very far away yeah. and to ship it than it is to buy something that's produced regionally. And on that economic model changes um, international supply and demand is going to be the primary form of the supply chain. Um, and so, you know, um, maybe in 20 or 30 years, that economic model is no longer viable and something else happens. And so I, I, I like thinking about maybe the kind of international supply chain working in tandem with more local regional systems um, so that if economic models do change then all of this infrastructure is not obsolete mm -hmm. in, a, in a short period so again i think um, the more one tries to fold into the logistics both at a cultural and at an economic and at a community level the, the better the better that model might be. Um, and it's interesting, just going back, to, um, Tim, when you do talk about, you know, the industrial companies of 100 years ago. Uh, and it's funny that you talk at real estate, I was reading somewhere that, you know, um, and I'm just using Amazon as an example here, you know what I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of um, holding them up as the kind of devil in the room or as the kind of um, the, the kind of icon in the room either um that companies before you know a company headquarters or the 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 physical infrastructure of an industrial company was um far more valuable and so you know you had sort of companies build and you know employ well-known architects to build beautiful industrial facilities and that's why we have some beautiful industrial buildings especially in the netherlands um that are legacies from an industrial era or a capitalist era 100 150 years ago now it's information systems and equipment and um research and innovation and knowledge is the kind of primary assets of these companies and that buildings and development is a lesser um, part of the whole business model um, and so I think it might be Walmart or some of these big grocery like online physical grocery stores that we have in the US um, 
you know, they write off their physical stores as a kind of um, expense at the end of the year not as a kind of asset to the company. Yeah. Um, so even within these models, the value of architecture, physical space and infrastructure is almost lessened when compared to information and equipment and research and innovation and all those other aspects that are driving the logistical economy. So I think that shift in what's yeah. important is also part of the, uh, part of the problem. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think yeah. Yeah, I read somewhere also of, um, someone saying that um, in the case of e-commerce, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the building is more like an architectural backside of an online front side. Yeah. And that's really what it is, uh, as anonymous as possible, yeah. uh, as flexible as possible. Yeah. So there's no, normally you yeah. don't even know what happens in there. Yeah. Which is uh, in a way a pity. Yeah. Yeah. So let's discuss that then, uh, also the spatial quality. We talked about the, the, the system and the economics behind it, but um, there were also in your presentations uh, a lot of inspirational ideas on how to shape, physically shape all, all, yeah, this logistic landscape. So let's go to the next poll, the next statement. Um, where is the logistic landscape of the future? And then we can also discuss, of course, what it will look like. But is it at a hub of different trans transport systems far away from your home? Is it underneath your apartment buildings and tennis court, a bit like, or in the houses, like a, a package to the people? Um, or is it the design, um, or is it just everywhere? And I think um, if the poll is getting launched uh, online, you can vote as well. Um, but Tim, can I first start with you? What do you think? Uh, where will this logistics system be? Yeah, I, I think as logistics itself is mm -hmm. such a, a broad definition. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, from that perspective, I think logistics is everywhere. It should be fully integrated. Yeah. But we have to think about what would be the best location for which type of logistics. Mm -hmm. So if you have construction logistics and moving bricks uh, into the city center of, of, the, of, the, of the city, that's totally different as delivering last mile uh, a package yeah. to your front door. And I think that's also different as keeping stock for a European distribution center mm -hmm. uh, that, that needs to ship the products efficiently to all the other countries in Europe. And I think from the different function of each, each uh, logistics activity, I think we will find them on a different place in our society. Yeah. Of an environment. So everywhere you would I think say. everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah. But not anywhere. But not anywhere. And that's, and that's, that's, uh, that's a yeah. good one, yes. I think everywhere you need it and everywhere you can make it into yeah. uh, a, a value creating element of mm -hmm. the city or, or a country, but not just uh, anywhere it goes. It's not food, it shouldn't be footloose. Mm. I yeah. fully agree on that. Yeah. Yes. And Claire? Yeah, I, I agree that it's a kind of scalable model, um, that it's back to the kind of, he it's heavy in some places where it needs to be. Like, as Tim said, the the Euro distribution center has to be enormous <laughs> mm -hmm. to do its mm -hmm. job. And then at, at, at the other scale, maybe in denser urban areas, um, it's almost, its presence is almost like an industrial design artifact, like these drop-off bins or, you know, sort of small-scale um, interface. They're, they're almost not even architecture. They're kind of what I call like at the scale of industrial design. Um, so it, it really does permeate um, regional planning to kind of architecture down to very small scale, um, these gadgets and... Yeah robotic systems um so it's very i agree that it's 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 very pervasive um yeah. in its which is i think op an opportunity um that you can start to think about logistics at those very different moments in the whole network in the whole chain it's not just, yeah we we kind of we, we we tend to dwell or maybe i'm projecting my own problems <laughs> in my own research here um we tend to dwell on the warehouse and maybe that's because it's the most legible part of the system and, and it's big. So it's easy to see. So it's easy to yeah. problematize it. Um, 
But I think this last mile and, and, and having very innovative ways at the kind of end of, of, of the delivery system is, yeah. is kind of exciting. Or whether you even need, and this is maybe, Tim, I'm wondering what you think about, even if you need to deliver to somebody's doorstep, like could there be more community delivery facilities? Like really do you need it delivered at your doorstep? Mm-hmm. I mean, okay, some people might and in a time of a pandemic, but that's a kind of an extreme scenario um that the kind of expectations of people for this convenience could also be explored a little bit um in this okay. kind of street yeah, I see Tim nodding. <laughs> no that, and that's indeed interesting but it's indeed also there's not one answer i think because we can question uh do we need to have it delivered at our doorstep yeah but it also helps my father to stay longer at home and he can still live at home at this moment because yeah. he's not able to go outside that easy anymore, but he's very able to take care of himself at home. So that yeah. means that he is very much supported by getting the groceries delivered at his doorstep. But maybe some new systems I'm thinking now. Yeah, there was a very interesting yeah. picture in Claire's uh, mm-hmm. presentation. That was interesting because I, I know that concept very much and it's in South Korea where you have, if you go to the the train station, there you have these online shopping windows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where you are waiting for the train, you can at that moment order your groceries with uh, your your phone, a cell phone, scanning the QR codes. And then meanwhile, while you're waiting, you're ordering your groceries. Then you go up and, and, and commute to your work. And on the way back, you can pick up your groceries. They are then fixed and finished and ready and bring them home. And that's an interesting way of doing it different. In my really opinion. efficient yes. as well. Yes. Um, and, and then you take care of it yourself because you're commuting yeah. it. You're, you're commuting yourself anyhow. So why not picking up your groceries? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's so there's a lot of also there is, I think, innovation and can help us a lot yeah. in order to yeah. think about smarter ways. And it combines very well with other means of making a sustainable city, such as public transport. Yeah integrates yeah. very well and yeah. in a way it's ironic also that we allow uh, logistics to be very close to us in the palm of our, of our hands yeah but, in our phones. and we also know that there are ports but the things that happen in between that we kind of yeah. are a bit fuzzy to yeah. us and yeah. while well, there is actually a lot of innovation that yeah. could could help us out yeah. yeah i'm also thinking right now uh, this social issue of loneliness also within cities it can also a uh, package to the people did a did a proposal for that to be some kind of social hubs where people within their neighborhoods uh mm-hmm. and then you don't have this package at your doorstep but someone maybe your neighbor or so and have this moment of social interaction uh, to combine mm-hmm. these kind of issues as well um i have some um uh, questions in the chat as well and then I also would like to come back to Claire's previous question about these inner city um, um, developments. Um, I have a question, can we turn a challenge around and look at what kind of environment we want uh, and how we can use logistic as leverage? So that's I think what we uh, discussed a bit about. So how, what kind of other um, uh, functions or challenges can we combined with this logistic challenge? Well, we, I, I think that starts with thinking of how will this space be used by mm-hmm. the logistics function itself, by the logistics company itself, and what can we do more with this? Yeah. Uh, and I can imagine that on certain logistics centers where people working mainly in a day shift, for mm-hmm. instance, or in, 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 in two shift operations, you can think of, hey, you have a large parking area available over there, which yeah. allows you also to fulfill a kind of public function. So why not building there a, let's say, theater, yeah. uh, where which you normally only visit during nighttime, mm-hmm. and, then, and then you have already, for instance, the parking facilities yeah. available because it's not used at that moment by the logistics. Do company. you make these long-term scenarios uh, on what you want what you would like to see not yeah, for hot us. ups i saw this yeah. amazing <laughs> hot up uh. yeah, <laughs> no, for us it's interesting to see and think about what is possible but mm-hmm. as we are not urban planners we will never be in the position yeah. in order to think on such way and it's, it's it's even unique that we have the opportunity on certain locations in the netherlands now to develop to develop a compass and a compass is yeah. for me um, a cluster of facilities and a cluster of buildings. So not just one single building, but if you can develop a kind of area, mm-hmm. at that moment you can add more functions to this yeah. area. 
And is that profitable? Is that interesting? Because that's an, a, an argument I hear all the time. That requires other thinking, because I think if you make it valuable, mm -hmm. if, it, if you make it a valuable place, if you make it a nice environment, if you make it a sustainable place, then everybody recognizes the value of this asset. Yeah. And the asset, the value of an asset is judged by uh, how is it appreciated by future tenants? Mm -hmm. Are tenants willing to pay a high rent for this? And are, yeah. are tenants uh, loyal to stay over here? Yeah. So I think if you if you add more money to your development and you make a more attractive place, you will find this back in the value of your of your building itself. And this yeah. is also how the investment market looks at it. Yeah. Well, yes, or it, it, it has also... to be different. So you have to think different in order to mm -hmm. prove the extra value that yeah. you create. Claire, how, how do you look at this uh, long term? Yeah, I mean, I, again, um, you know, it's easy as a kind of, you know, researcher to kind of mm -hmm. make these claims and, and um, yeah. Tim's on the ground. And, and I think the financial mechanisms for these projects are probably very complex. Um, and so I don't know, you know, I, I, I do think, though, that maybe cities should get involved municipalities get involved like there are other models out there i'm just thinking you know we have um parts of american cities that need a lot of economic stimulus because they um high unemployment rates and industry moved out of parts mm -hmm. of cities in the 1950s and these areas really haven't picked up since then and so I'm always thinking, you know, couldn't cities maybe, why couldn't those areas be re, reused as logistics centers? There's still people living and working and going to school in these neighborhoods. And there's very little else because the kind of city has kind of forgotten about these areas. And so I think that if there could be a smarter approach to the kind of finding the real estate, um, finance models, that both enable logistic companies to do their thing, um, mm -hmm. but also coverage that investment for their good. Um, and again, that might be naive, but I think it's, it's, it's the intersection of planning, maybe some innovations in logistics and, and municipalities um, to kind of yeah, maybe it shouldn't be way out on the edge of the city. Maybe it should be in yeah. this neighborhood. Um, and we will help you with that model as we can. And there's benefit for everyone. But again, that's a little utopian in its idea. Um, but I do see opportunities in revitalizing post-industrial areas. Yeah. How do you look at that in the Netherlands? Well, I, th I think I do believe that we we need municipalities, but more for thinking with us and allowing to mm -hmm. develop multiple functions on one on one place. Because at this moment, regulations prohibit us to do so. Mm -hmm. it's for, most of the occasion, most zoning plans allow for one single activity. On the other hand, I don't think we do need we don't need the finance for this because I do believe that we have to find and develop the right business models in mm -hmm. order to. Because then it's really self-sustainable. Uh, because otherwise, you're yeah. always looking for. And what do you need for that? Well, I think the only that? thing that becomes difficult mm -hmm. in a business model is if you develop public space. So, in, in case the municipality also wants to create public space over there, yeah. then we need to be able to use yeah. also then the budget that's created yeah. for developing. And that's something Claire mentioned as well, right? Uh, is it is it the, the the zoning thing when you want to go more up, then you have to give back. Uh, to, to some kind of public space, um, could that kind of instruments work? Well, I, it, to my opinion, yes, because that's uh, we have another project where we build a um, um, a city park on top of the roof of a building, where mm -hmm. we had the exact same idea, uh, and the idea was there from okay, let's let's give back the land use that we use on ground floor. We can give this back on upper level. Yeah. Uh, but then, if you if you go ahead on this, then it might be difficult in order to justify this. Mm -hmm. so then it will be, if you do it, then it's just a showcase project, and then you allow that this will cost you a little more money. Yeah. I think it can still justify, but then it's 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 uh, in in profit wise, it's completely different. But on the other hand, if you look at 
growing products on the top of your roof. That's mm -hmm. something that's easily done. Yeah. And then you can have these exactly greenhouses on top of it. And there's yeah. your business model. Yeah. And then we can see, well, what's happening the moment that I use my roof for greenhouses? Mm -hmm. We're also densifying the city. So uh, exactly. public space will be much more valued in the future than it is now because yeah. we, we need it more. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I also think that in that terms, in the financial terms, it's, it's a case of risk assessment and doing that differently because if uh, these the things that we are the solutions that we're discussing now at the table mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're a bit risky at the moment for investors because m they may not work some of them may not work on the other hand the solutions that we have now that we're building at the moment mm -hmm. they may also be depreciated earlier than we think they may be may run out of of business in, in 15 yeah. years and that, that's also a risk exactly exactly we have to start thinking differently because if, if this is important to us and, and we should all care about our environment yeah. and I think we should sp spend a lot of time on it thinking about what good solutions would yeah. be and the reason for us to step into this is that we also think that this is if we do not come up with good solutions and if we do not come up with a good plan uh, then this we might yeah. risk the future of, of yeah. uh, the sector and of our business itself yeah. and I always say without a plan you become part of somebody else's yeah. plan Definitely. And I prefer to develop my own plans and to come up with good solutions. Yeah. Uh, and it would be even yes. <laughs> better if, if the logistics can contribute to all these exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, challenges. And you already called uh, of, uh, mentioned uh, the housing crisis. We have in the Netherlands, uh, we have lots and lots and lots of houses to be built. Um, we now Claire mentioned already the, the inner city uh, areas, the, the, the urban areas. Can logistics even help in building these houses, like greenhouses on top? or can, can they contribute to this housing crisis, if I may say it like this? I, definitely, but also here we have to, we need also then the use, I think, of urban planners, of mm -hmm. architects, of, of city developers, because... But what can uh, you do? Yeah, but this, the, I, I will explain, because yeah. I think, let's, uh, um, whether it's possible at the moment, mm -hmm. via a zoning plan, that's something we can overcome, because yeah. that's a decision we can take ourselves. The only thing is how to develop a area where you would like to live, mm -hmm. but integrate this with a logistics area. Because on the logistics side, yeah. we um, uh, do have a lot of truck movements. And how can you build this in such a way that it still becomes a nice and friendly environment? Yeah. And I think it is very much possible because all these trucks are only on one side of the building itself. And somebody mentioned today a very nice remark mm -hmm. on the back side of the building itself you hear the birds singing and that's I think still still possible because on the front side you you have all the trucks but the building itself is such a block already it's for protecting kind of you for noise yeah. and it helps a lot in if you look at even our uh, labor migrants problem for instance in the Netherlands mm -hmm. yeah, so why don't we use the backside of the building to create but then create nice environments yeah, for, yeah. Uh, temporary housing you know, temporary housing, but also I, I also think well, if you do not only allow for temporary housing, but if you give it a more longer length, then the investment market is very willing in order to build other accommodation. Yeah. And if you, I always say, if you if you bring somebody to a camping site, then he will camp, and then he mm -hmm. will uh, start, and so he will live differently as if you bring him into and you give him a nice apartment, for yeah. instance. Yeah. And then the integration in the society is also completely different. Yeah. That's the example of Amazon that Claire mentioned also, the, z the new type of zoning of things that actually combine very nicely together, but you didn't think of combining yeah. them before. Yeah, and and let's, see, let's be sure, because we all see Amazon as the builder and the creator of all these large big boxes. But on the other hand, I think Amazon is really changing our uh, industry and our market by bringing in a lot of innovation. Yeah. They've done a lot of good stuff over there. So I. I really like the company itself but i also mm -hmm. see that it's on one end very innovative on one end bringing service orientation back to yeah. the market again but on the other end of course they also build infrastructure where yeah. we have to reconsider if we can do this better yeah. yeah claire if we if we dream about this new future cities these green cities with uh, uh, enough housing with places to recreate uh, where do you think the, the next steps within the uh, logistics sector um, what, what, what should we re research next if, for, yeah, really work on tomorrow? We saw these inspiring things. Um, um, yeah, what kind of topics would you should suggest? Well, I, <clears throat> it was interesting, and this is just connected with the 
pavilion in Venice that, um, and it's an, actually in the Netherlands, you also, I think Amsterdam, like Dublin claims to be one of the data center capitals of Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the data center is a kind of subset of the whole logistics network. Um, so there's a problem in Ireland where they're using too much electricity. And so we now need to think about renewable energy systems. So the government is trying to kind of encourage the US companies that are in Ireland to enter into partnerships with energy companies to build wind farms over on the west coast of Ireland um, so that they're selling um, power back to the grid. And so when Tim mentioned the um, 800 electric vehicles for the new facility mm -hmm. that he's developing. And you said something about where that energy comes from. So now I'm thinking of, you know, um, you know, sort of, again, it's a little naive, but energy systems that are designed in tandem with the logistical facilities, because uh, that electricity has to come from somewhere. Or I think um, <laughs> yeah, Tim, uh, or, Tim is more than willing to respond on that a, a bit, I, I guess, <laughs> yeah. since you're already. Well, we had a we had a very interesting debate this morning with the the energy companies in the Netherlands because at this moment in the Netherlands we struggle a lot uh, with transporting the energy through our existing energy network, yeah. and it's also a logistics uh, problem because if you if you look at from the very large electricity centrals we have these very big cables we call them highways and we mm -hmm. they are going into the netherlands and they end up in very small wires uh, that end up in our streets in order to distribute all the energy to our houses and at this moment in the energy transition uh, in the netherlands we've said well let's not use gas anymore and that's that's uh, a sustainable measurement but on the other hand it doubles the use of electricity so that means mm. that we add now more traffic on these very small roads, call them the small cables in our streets. Uh, at the same time, we say, well, let's build, uh, uh, let's use electrical vehicles. Uh, and, and, and we are starting to make it not only one route, but two direction roads, because we are also generating uh, solar energy, generating wind energy. And this is all transported now on the very um smallest part of our network so that we add highway traffic on the mm -hmm. smallest roads that's actually how you can uh, compare this mm -hmm. and we will never sol solve this uh, problem by building bigger cables and building yeah. more because that's that's simply not possible anymore that doesn't fit yeah. in the ground anymore mm -hmm. and at this moment 75 percent of our electricity network is congested so that means that at this moment you cannot ask for a new connection in more than half of the Netherlands because there's no capacity anymore to transport this. And the, the conclusion we draw this morning is that logistics facilities will become a vital part of the infrastructure in order to deal and to build a more sustainable electricity network. Because we, on one hand, we can generate a lot of solar energy on the roofs from the buildings we have. If we are able to distribute this locally, but also if we are able to store energy on site, not only our own mm -hmm. solar, solar energy, but also the energy, uh, if there's, you have to balance, I think, more supply and demand at this moment, because there is sufficient energy yeah. available, the transport capacity is not there, and that's something you can solve on the logistics facilities. We have the infrastructure. Yes, well. and if we have, for instance, in Amsterdam, 800 vehicles mm -hmm. charging over there, yeah then you can use all these batteries and yeah. at that moment to offload yeah. the energy from the from the network itself so that at that moment there's transport capacity available again for all the society yeah. and so that there's a or lot of ways where we can the yeah they will there? become critical oh. nodes in the network yeah. or or that you're yeah no i i, I agree that problem because we're kind of developing 21st century um ideas about living on 18th and 19th century infrastructure grids um, and so they're kind of just can't keep up but um, um, I was going to say something there about the the grid in in Ireland and I'm I just uh, oh yeah no the, the the kind of battery that then the logistics center 
you know, is smart about its battery storage and it charges its own vehicles, but then it's storing other energy that it can provide to some other industry or another fleet of vehicles for some public transportation system. Um, so I think that the energy loops that I think every nation, it's funny that with the COPT meeting starting next week in Glasgow, um, I think these larger scale circular questions actually go beyond logistics. Um, but it would be interesting if, if logistics could kind of jump on the bandwagon as a to yeah. catalyze we are, we are, some yeah. of these new circular relationships might be an correct, interesting... Correct. We are building at this moment the first off-grid warehouse in the Netherlands. So that means that we will not get any energy anymore from the network, from the grid. And this is partly financed by the fact that we add a lot of big storage container, big batteries uh, on site, where we on one hand store the energy that we generate from the roof, but we get paid for this by the, the network providers if they can make use of these batteries as well in order to balance uh, supply and demand. Which so is then the energy will go to the city centre, can go to the city well, centre if, if, as well? Well, there is no uh, um, a transport capacity mm -hmm. available to supply us, but it doesn't mean that at certain moments on the network itself they have um, a congestion that mm -hmm. means that there's too much that they want to transport over yeah. the network and if there are battery storage uh, if there's battery storage available and they mm -hmm. can temporarily use they can offload this from the network at that yeah. moment yeah so, so a function for logistics exactly and actually i get a, a lot of money paid for this which actually helped me a lot on making a business case for yeah. a first off-grid distribution center yeah. yeah i i have another question um, with the increasing popularity of these 15 minutes uh, city concepts, uh, mm -hmm. getting your groceries between in, in, um, yeah. within uh, 15 minutes, should uh, city planners, uh, designer, um, you, logistics experts or, or developers, um, contact them in advance as well to design the city with you? Should you be on a, on a table? <laughs> if we don't do it, it will happen on another way that we probably didn't plan and didn't, don't like. Because this is what happened when we moved buying products from the shops and, and we now entered to the online warehouses mm -hmm. and allowed for next day deliveries. The response was that the logistics sector or the big retailers built online warehouses, yeah. the big boxes. Yeah. If companies like Gorillas, who had, uh, have just received mm -hmm. a huge investment uh, Injection again. The grocery shopping exactly. within uh, 50 minutes. Yeah. yeah, so then you can you can buy your products and it gets delivered within 10 yeah. minutes. If everybody, if all the consumers in the Netherlands say, yeah. hey, they, this is a very nice uh, new service mm -hmm. and we all start to use this, then at that moment we will see not the big boxes, but then we yeah. see more than a few thousand smaller hubs in yeah. order to get this. That'd be in the vacant shops within the city centre? Yeah, but if, so it, that means it's an, it could be an opportunity in order to find out if the existing infrastructure could be mm -hmm. used more efficiently and effectively. But if we do not do this together, then the market companies will find yeah. their own way to deal with this and, and right. then you could end up with an infrastructure you don't like. Yeah. I think the, the development of these logistic yeah. service concepts is a lot faster than the development of cities. Yeah. So there is a discompass in there. But uh, I think it, it's very uh, necessary to listen to the logistics sector or to co-develop spaces and infrastructures yeah. or to be yeah. at least flexible to incorporate these things later in exactly. the buildings that we make. Because it will happen anyway, because that's what the consumers dictate. They dictate yeah. what kind of infrastructure should be built, because if you do not build it, then they buy it from your competitor, mm -hmm. who will build it. Yeah. yeah. We have to, uh, to, to round off this discussion a bit, but I would like uh, to give you first at the table and then Claire at the end uh, one last opportunity to, do, um, to make a final statement or, or to make a call also for the Floriado, of course, which is going to be um, next year here. Um, what would you like to see? Uh, do you have a call for action or, or, or uh, someone to work with or, or no, anything you want to say to... Uh, uh, but I think if, if, if uh, I could say is that for me it's very much a call for action, but also a call for cooperation. So mm -hmm. let's let's sit together and yeah. let's talk about how we can better integrate logistics yeah. instead of discussing whether we still like yeah. logistics. And who, if you are uh, the person uh, who's going to pick up the phone, who will you call? Well, Maybe not tomorrow, but. 
I've done that. Weeks. I've done that already. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, and, and and who did and respond to your I've call? I've called some co-developers. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've called some uh, construction companies. I've yeah. called. Um, how can you say this? The the companies that, on behalf of the municipality, yeah. develop certain areas. Um, so we've invited them, mm -hmm. and we've invited also the logistics sector, yeah. but then the branch organization of the logistics sector, mm -hmm. in order to form together a kind of new community where we can think about how to do this. Yeah, because and I you will help in designing all these new... Yeah, we should all together models. think about what's, what's the challenge. Yeah. And if we do not come up with some ideas or advice, mm -hmm. then probably this will end up in kind of regulation yeah. we don't like. Yeah. 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 Merten? Call for action, yes. I, th I think that the Netherlands has branded itself as a gateway to Europe for, mm -hmm. since the 1980s uh, as a, a distribution country. I think it's time for all of us in the Netherlands, governments but also companies, uh, to, to bring this to the next level and to uh, try to make uh, the landscape of logistics sustainable yeah. uh, and try to be the front runner in that. Yeah. Uh, using all New the concepts that we've discussed yeah. today. Absolutely. Yeah, hot tubs, sport fields, all of it. green <laughs> parks, yeah. housing, exactly. everything. Uh, Claire? Um, yeah, no, I, I think um, I, I'm thinking, and maybe this is a bit self-serving, um, encouraging some sort of um, financing of design research. Like I'm thinking in the 19 or actually in the 19 teens, like Corbusier wasn't like the, the city of tomorrow or um, was partially funded by a, a car company, you know, the kind of Paris project Le Voisin. It was a car company because they had a kind of invested interest in the city of the future, given the technology they were developing. Or I know that Audi similarly ran design challenges, maybe seven or eight or ten years ago um, that tried to speculate with architects the future city but of course vis-a-vis -vis their own automobile systems um, and so i'm thinking there could be um like similar sort of design business research um that, that could work tandem with planning and architect and some logistical businesses somehow along those lines that could yeah. just spin out a campaign or spin because design i think it's not necessarily to solve the problem i think design has a role in communicating this to yeah. a larger audience um, and they don't have to be kind of again practical solutions but they could be kind of a little outlandish just to get the point across mm -hmm. that we can be innovative in thinking about these systems yeah. moving forward. And so it would be great to see a kind of forum for that at Floriad um, as a kind of global um, venue that would communicate yeah. these ideas to a broader audience um, so that it doesn't stay as a kind of niche academic project. Mm -hmm. And it, on the other hand, it doesn't stay as only a business model that needs to be made viable, but that it those two modes of knowledge overlap um, to yeah. sort of just yeah. brainstorm. Definitely, um, very, definitely. So very, very clear uh, um, call to action as well. And maybe there will be some space at the Floriade um, and I think that's very interesting and very important what you stated as well, that it's, it's a way of communicating in, in, in order to yeah, lift these discussions to a next level. And also what I'm um, uh, experiencing a bit is also to make, to then take a step back and how can we really work on that? Because dreaming about all these uh, um, inspiring and amazing ideas that's that's wonderful and we should definitely do that to bring it all to a next level but also how can we put it into practice and realize these campuses yes. and bring those campuses to uh, even further and and build on those, uh, those those green cities look for the experiment definitely looking for the experiment thank you all so much tim mcmahon merton nefs and of course claire lister from chicago uh, thank you so much, also the audience, of course, um, for joining us online. Um, 
The next conversation will be about local resources, or resources and renewable energy, and that will take place on December 2nd, uh, also um, at 3 o'clock Dutch time. Um, all these meetings will be... Um, uh, well, there will be made essays uh, based on these dialogues by Sanne van den Bremer, which you can find uh, online uh, later, and you can also look back this meeting online. Um, thank you so much, Tim, Mert and Claire. Um, thank you, and hope to see you next time. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs> thank you. Have a thank great day. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.